I want to talk about uh, a narration a little bit and, and show you a last piece on the use of narration. Um, as I think I mentioned to you guys before, you know, I really like using narration. I, I know that some people are kind of purists and they don't like to use narration. They think it, it's, it's intrusive. They think it interferes in, in the flow, if you will, of, of the piece. Um, I don't find it intrusive at all. I think narration can be really, really uh, useful because it connects the conceptual. And it, is, it, it constitutes the conceptual links between pieces of, of your, your documentary. Um, uh, it's what connects the dots between those, those little, you know, the clips of, of visual and oral material. And there's what I like, one of the things I like most about narration is the fact that it allows me to put my personal stamp on, on anything that I do. When you hear my voice, um, you know that, that, that I'm responsible for the piece largely. Uh, but there's a way to do narration, and I think, you know, in, in, as, as, as Chad and I have been discussing through this whole workshop, sometimes less is more. And narration, you know, you don't want to uh, 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 make long pieces of narration with long sentences and long paragraphs because people just can't absorb that much information at one time. You know, narration and your pieces are all about conversation with your audience. You pose a question, you pose a, a, a conflict, you pose a problem, and you answer that question, you resolve that problem. Okay, that's what these conversations with your audience are all about. It's conversation. Uh, and there's a way to deliver this conversation, with, to deliver this narration in a, in, in a manner that's, that's more effective than others. And there are a couple of things that I'd like you to remember as we, as we discuss narration. Could you read this piece? And this is from a, a wildly popular uh, documentary that I'm sure some of you are going to recognize as you hear. I, I'd ask you not to, to reveal what this documentary is, but can you read that, that, that narration as you would for the piece, please? There are a few places harder to get to in this world, but there aren't anywhere it's harder to live. We're not getting a lot of information, are we? There's no, there's no, there's no data there, there's no, there's no statistic, there's, no, there's not a name, there's, not a, there's nothing. There's, it's just a feeling. Go ahead. The average temperature here at the bottom of the earth is a balmy 58 degrees below. That's when the sun is out. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very nice. It Go wasn't ahead. always like this. Antarctica used to be a tropical place, densely forested, and teeming with life. So for the first time, though, in like in three sentences, for the first time, we know we have something solid. We're talking about Antarctica. We know what we're talking about. Does anybody, anybody know where we are in terms of this documentary? Don't tell me the name of it. Has anybody seen this thing? No? Was it just recently done? No. Okay. A couple years ago? Two years, maybe? Okay, go on. But then the continent started to drift south, and by the time it was done drif drifting, the dense forests had all been replaced with a new ground cover, ice. Very good. It almost sounds like uh, Al Gore's documentary. Uh, yeah. yeah. it's, <laughs> it's not. It's not. <laughs> She's doing a terrific job of this. When I when I have these pieces, man, when I when I uh, before I, I narrate something, you know, I have my, my, my written script here. And what I'll do is I'll underline the, the, the important parts of the script, the, the, the words of the script that I want to that I want to give a little more oomph to. There are a few places harder to get to in this world, so I'll underline harder to harder to get to in this world, but there aren't any where it's harder to live. And sometimes I'll put like jaggy little marks underneath the words that I want to draw out. Right? You know, if I want to make it longer, hard to live. Um, um, Chad and I were, were doing the same thing upstairs with his with this piece about uh, the artistry and flow. The average temperature here at the bottom of the earth, and one of the things that I do when I read these things, I never sit down and look at it and hold the script like this. Because when you do, you know, you, you're suffocating the, the power of your voice. Your voice gets its strength from here. And the more you have this closed off and you're reading into something, the more you're suffocating your voice. What I do is, you know, I always stand and I put this thing on a wall or on a tripod or something and I free up my hands so I'm not holding anything so I can use my hands to gesticulate. My voice is, is, is free, it's open, I talk to this thing and I can move my hands and it gives me a sense of, of emotion I think, a sense of power. Yeah? So a couple of things. Um, I write this thing out and I underline the pieces that I want to pump up. I determine which are the words that I want to draw out. I, I free up my hands 
I, I use my voice box to convey the message. I'm looking straight forward. And I exaggerate, I actually exaggerate my facial features sometimes because it'll make the words come out clearer if you exaggerate your facial features. Okay, these are all tricks. I used to, I used to be a correspondent for NBC Radio News, and ABC Radio News um, uh, uh, in Central America and, and Mexico. And these are the things you learn when you do this kind of stuff. It is much of the Penguins. And I'll tell you, you know, if, uh, I'll show you, and you can, you can hear this, but when, when you see what they do, with the images in conjunction with this narration and the music, it's really quite extraordinary in the sense that they, 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 they carry out this same conversation that they just carried out with us uh, uh, verbally, right? They don't tell you exactly what they're talking about until, until you know, they draw you into the piece. And, and we're, I'm engaged in this thing like the minute that, I, that, I, that, that it starts. Right? And they do the same thing with the visuals. They're not, they're not giving it all away until a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes into the piece. It's narration, you use it to connect those dots. You use narration to build up suspense, to build up tension. You use narration to explain what people are seeing. Sometimes it's not clear. You use narration to summarize. Uh, I want to show you a piece that I did a few years ago in Afghanistan. I was with a bunch of Marines in, in the Helmand River Valley, which is in the southern part of the country. And I had to narrate the piece because there were just so many moving parts that you wouldn't be able to get this thing if I didn't. Actually, this piece, uh, Afghanistan, The Forgotten War, I did it for now on PBS, and it really embodies a lot of the teaching points that I've been trying to convey to you guys um, over these past few days of this workshop. Narration. Um, um, controlling idea, uh, you know, some of the camera uh, uh, moves that, that we've been talking about, composition, um, uh, how to relate to, to uh, the, the, the people you're covering, how to select uh, characters and so forth. So a lot of it is really here, and it's going to be the last thing that I show you during this, um, during this workshop. So, and it's kind of long, and I'll stop when, when, when it's appropriate to do so. Welcome to now. Can the U.S. military be peacemakers as well as warriors? In southern Afghanistan, the Marines face some tough fighting, but also some very unhappy villagers. Stay with us. Now on PBS. On the Road with host David Brancaccio and senior correspondent Maria Inojosa. Funding for now is provided by the Orfala Family Foundation, the Park Foundation, the Marguerite Casey Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, the CS Fund, the Desjardins Blackman Fund, and by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. The war in Afghanistan was the occasion for a rare moment of semi-agreement between John McCain and Barack Obama. This week, both said they want a renewed and enlarged military effort there. What's going on in Afghanistan is pretty ugly. Taliban forces have made a broad comeback. Casualties are way up for the U.S. and its allies. The challenge is immense, not just to win battles, but also to win over villagers to forge a stable peace. Bill Gentile filed this report from the front lines in southern Afghanistan. Okay, I'm, I'm looking for air on target one. Okay, I'm going to make this the truck. I'm going to put a 500-pound air, air burst over the truck. The 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit has come to a tough neighborhood, territory controlled by the Taliban near the border with Pakistan. Okay, so you're going to let me run uh, first pass and second pass before you do artillery. And already, uh, before we got already and 60s. Okay, Roger. So you got that whole minute and a half free. Sweet, I'll take it. Okay. 31 year old Captain Sean Dynan commands Alpha Company. The months that the Marines are spending here are part of a broad strategy to retake control of the area along the Afghan Pakistan border where Taliban and Al Qaeda insurgents have dug in. Dynan and his men use pinpoint accuracy targeting the enemy. Right now, sir, we identified a uh, the enemy's doing their resupply. We've been tracking on this in a couple, for a couple days. Um, 
we've actually had eyes on. We have eyes on their weapon systems, on the ammo. Uh, so we're going to hit both the ammo truck that they're doing the resupply from, and we're going to hit the, uh, the compounds that they're moving to right now. There is some confusion about the exact location of the enemy. The Marines are concerned about killing civilians, and the airstrike is canceled. The mission of the Marines represents a new strategy aimed at winning Afghan hearts and minds. For nearly three weeks, I followed the Marines on the front lines of what has been called the real war on terror. Their goal, to push the Taliban back and destroy its fixed positions, and just as important, to win the support of the villagers and get the economy restarted. There's a question here. Can these seasoned fighters also play the role of peacemakers and win the trust of the local population? Machine guns will be at that corner over there. The Marines are operating in one of the richest agricultural regions of Afghanistan. The Helmand River Valley has become a key route for Taliban fighters, weapons and materiel flowing further north into Afghanistan and for opium flowing south from this region into Pakistan. This is the opium capital of the world. What's the controlling idea to this piece? It's kind of a, it's kind of a dual controlling idea. Rhett, what do you think? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, can they be successful in uh, forging some kind of a peace, or some kind of a, an agreement with the locals? Uh, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, it's twofold. The, their mission is twofold. It's a military mission and a political mission, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's, what the, that's the controlling idea. And this is what I shoot. This is what I, you know, ask these guys about. This is what I'm looking for. When, when certain characters emerge who can, who can support this controlling idea, I'm all over them, okay? I follow them, I question them, I try to cultivate that the, the, the dramatic arc that, that is linked to this controlling idea. And, and it's, it's opium that helps fund the insurgents' fight. What's up, Lieutenant? All right, in the village that we can see directly to our east, you see the long wall that's on the east side of our compound across the poppy field to the right. Second Lieutenant Sean Miller works under Captain Dynan. Miller commands Alpha Company's second platoon. Uh, my Western Post sighted a white pickup truck break. Miller gets word on the insurgents and moves his men into position to take them on. Uh, we have Marines in 59, 54, 55. Over. Taliban insurgents seized this area from the Afghan government about two years ago. Back in April when the Marines arrived, the civilians had already fled to the desert because they knew a fight was coming. In May, as the Marines advanced, the Taliban put up ferocious resistance. But a relentless Marine offensive pushed the Americans deep into the valley. This area now is a free fire zone. Anyone still here is a suspected Taliban fighter and may become a target. Miller gets word that a nearby squad of Marines is taking fire. They were engaged by RPG shot uh, and small arms fire break. I move up with Staff Sergeant Stephen Vallejo. Vallejo is a Kickapoo Indian from Kansas City. This is Vallejo's second deployment. His first was to Iraq. Apache 2, this is Lightning. How do I know all this stuff about these guys? He's, in, he's, a, he's an American Indian, uh, uh, you know, he's been to Iraq before. How do, how do I find all this stuff out? I sit down and I talk with them, and I'm, I'm, I've got the camera on them because I don't, you know, I try not to like write too many things down. I try to get it all on camera. So if I need him talking to the camera, if I need his voice, if I need the natural sound, everything is here in the camera. I've got video for the video. I've got uh, video for still pictures if I want to make them for a website. I've got their sound on tape so that I can use, for, use it for radio or for this piece. I can take their sound and I can write the narration for my, my documentary. But everything comes out of these machines if you know how to use these machines properly. Send it, Lightning. Dispatch 2. Roger, be advised. Myself and Comanche are moving to that complex uh, just north of Comanche's old pause over. We meet the snipers lugging a long range 50 caliber rifle. We make our way past fields of poppies and immediately take enemy fire. Is that incoming, sir? Yes, it is. That's incoming. The Marines respond with artillery and with the sniper rifle. Hey, Stan, sir. We got a tractor moving what appears to be mortar tubes at uh, 3998 mils, 950 yards. Yeah, I got it. Got it. Yeah, it's, uh... You hey, done, sir? Hey, one man f***ing uh, KIA along the canal. 
And it's possible. Did I have what? Did you have a sound recorder separately? Or no, I'm using a Sony EX1. It's got a, it's got a shotgun mic on it. And everybody who I, who I can possibly put my wireless onto, I wire them. Ah. And if I don't have people, you know, like the, some of these guys, I don't, I don't have time to get them wired up or they're not my characters or I'm, my, my relationship with them is too fleeting. What I do is I'll put the thing in my own pocket and I'll wire myself so I have two tracks of sound. Guaranteed, I'm going to have sound. One way or another, I'm going to get sound, yeah. This is probably coming from your boom that we're hearing the explosions, or is that from yeah. the wireless? No, it's from the, it's, from the, it's from the shotgun mic. It's from the boom mic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like from this close to this guy. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I, can, I can touch him. I'm and really close, so I get everything that he says. The guy who gave the update that the tubes were being moved on the tractor, did you have him mic'd, or was that from... No, the, I'm just so close to him that the shotgun mic is picking it up. Um, yeah, do you well. have a, a professional team or someone who sweetens the sound for you and kind of times no, the video? No, they just did it on Avid. Oh, really? Yeah, this is, a, this is, I shot all this stuff and I, and I, and I went to New York uh, with a hard drive So it's a team and a of script. people of sound designers and stuff that go over it and pump up the, the bass and all that kind of stuff. Well, sound designer I think is a little bit, and, you know. I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think we'd call them, it's, it's not a, a post-production house. No, it's not okay. like Hennigers here in, 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 uh, in Virginia. Yeah, it's a guy behind an app. That's pretty sweet sound, really. Sorry? That's pretty mm -hmm. sweet sound. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Sony EX1 captures incredible stuff. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, my whole idea is to simplify everything that I do. You know, literally, I went to Afghanistan with, with a backpack and all my stuff in it. So the, the computer was in there, hard drives were in there, the camera was in there. Everything that I needed to do, my stuff was in there. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I want to keep it that way, simple. When I start at, uh, adding things on and attaching things, it just makes things more complex. What kind of camera did you say it was? Sony EX1. It's, oh. it's kind of a very, very high-end, um, um, it's a computer with a lens on it, basically. Also, in current affairs, I think there's a point at which they would not go past in terms of post-production changing. You know, yeah. If, because even in sound, you can change the editorial sure. events. Yeah, and they don't have time. I mean, yeah. you know, I was up in New York for two weeks. I had 10 days to do this with, with an editor. I walked in with a script, the same thing that I'm trying to encourage you guys to do. You know, this written, this, this roadmap. Put the script out on, on, on the table, you know, of the, of the editor, the guy behind the, the Avid machine. Gave a treatment to the executive producer, the, the thing that's written in story form like the proposal is. You know, and I said, let's go. And I was there for, for two weeks and we got this thing out. It's 23 minutes long, it's fast. Edit this thing, a 23 minute piece in two weeks is fast. It's a deadly guerrilla war that goes on day and night. Hey, get back. What the heck are you doing down there? The next morning, the Marines spot insurgents moving in on their position from this compound. Miller requests air and artillery support. Black Knight 6, this is Apache 2. This is Miller's first deployment, which makes him a rookie. The 24-year-old is from Austin, Texas. He coordinates the 40-plus Marines in his platoon, as well as the air and artillery assault. Huey and Cobra helicopters initiate the attack. What's that sound? It's a helicopter. Yeah? The... Is it? The rotors? Yeah? Is that what it is? No, I think it's a, a cannon. Uh, it's a, a, a Gatling gun on it, maybe. It's a Gatling gun? I that's the sound of rapid-fire machine guns strafing enemy positions. You see what narration does? Yeah. Narration tells people what they're seeing. Sometimes yeah. people don't know what they're seeing. Yeah. That's how useful this stuff is. Miller must be sure that neither the artillery nor his Marines on the ground accidentally hit the helicopters overhead. Timing is critical. I'll tell you when to shoot, all right? Three minutes! Three minutes! Rockets from the helicopters set the fields ablaze. The helicopters pull back and Miller orders ground fire. Hey, we got it. Fire! Get the tree line. Get ready to see far. All right, reverse to the left, reverse to the left. 
Right there. Got him now. All right, cease fire. Hey, cease fire, cease fire. Cease fire. All right. Now it's just if we see a move, we can kill him. That first shot they did, that place went up in flames. I don't know if it was just because it was dry or they had something down there. And finally, more artillery. Oh! I think they're pissed. What do you think? I think they're dead. Uh, we Why is he telling me this stuff? We started a blaze all along tree, tree like a I just asked him. I said, Lieutenant, what just happened? So he tells me this stuff. You know, see how this, now I get, I engage these guys, but you have to do it at, at, at strategic times. You can't, while the, all this stuff is chaos is going on, you just get, hey, Lieutenant, tell me, you know, it's like, get out of here, man. What you said is I'm gonna smack you. <laughs> Worst, you're out of here, yeah. you know? Uh, we started a blaze uh, all along that tree line for about 200 meters. If there's anybody hiding in the tree line, uh, they're either out because of the fire or they're dead because the fire is an explosion. So uh, for our purpose, that was a good day. The Marines now are in sight of the Amir Aga village and bazaar, the nucleus of insurgent activity. I don't think the Humvee can get across this. But before moving in, Alpha Company must first clear the surrounding area. Don't move without a guardian angel. All, right, all the time, make sure someone's covering your six. Okay? Uh, it's going to be amazing there. If you can, uh, you know, peek over a wall before you enter in uh, from an unexpected direction, do that as well. If it's okay with you, if we, if we find ourselves right up against a bunker and there's any suspicion, even if it's not firing, I'm going to throw a grenade in it. Absolutely. Okay. Like fires is channel one. And yeah, that's right. We get the temperature rises to about 120 degrees. Hey, hurry up, fill the to the right. Hey, probably leave a team over here and then we'll go across to the next one. We just got to check if we can move across this way or back behind this building. All this has been cleared? Everything behind has been cleared. Okay, everything behind me. The Marines find a bunker that had been used to ambush one of their patrols just days before. One Marine was killed here. Hey, Roger, we're putting a green chem light. These Marines prepare to blow it up. Uh, it's just a snake, a compound, a lot of locks. You can't get over unless you cross down a road, which we don't want to do. So it's just going to be slow. And so far, no resistance, no sighting of booby traps or anything. Neither resistance nor civilians. The streets are deserted as the Marines continue their sweep. Hey, Mike, there may be no resistance, but that doesn't mean there's no danger. There's a gun in the window right now, on the second story over. Hi, Roger that. Madden Tanner, you want to hold right here? Whoa, what's that right there? You hear that beep, beep, yeah. beep, beep, you know? This guy is wearing, you, you get this sound, it really it sounds it's awesome. intriguing. Yeah. But So he's got a pocket on his uniform right here. So I've got my wireless in his pocket. It's running under his bulletproof vest up here, like right by his throat where it's supposed to be. So when he's talking to me 15, 20 feet away from me, I have perfect sound from him. When he's talking to his commander, Dynan, the guy with the bald head, I hear him when he's far away. And when Dynan talks to him because he has a receiver right here, I can hear what Dynan's saying three kilometers away. So I hear every, what everybody's saying. And I can anticipate you know, what I want to do as a result of hearing what these guys are saying. So this sound is critical. Again, it's the heartbeat of what we do. It's the heartbeat of, of, of document or of this kind of reportage, you know. And and those those little wireless mics are just they're invaluable. But check this out here. Oh, yeah. what's that right there? Oh, that. I mean the hardy shell that's sitting right there. Yeah. yeah. The Marines are too pressed. <laughs> so, how many of you guys were in the military? Anybody here in the military? No. How big is this thing? This artillery shell. How big is it? Leonard, do you have a sense? Is it, is it this big? Is it this big? It's about that big? It's about that big? Yeah? Remember a couple of days ago, it seems like a couple of weeks ago, we talked about pan shots and so forth? You know how it connects like one piece of material to another, in this case visual, as opposed to a sweater? Yeah? So what I do now is, this is a really simple movement. It's for time to determine whether this artillery round simply failed to explode or was wired to kill them. It gives you some sense of context, some sense of scale. When I go from there, what I'm really doing here is I'm saying, this thing here is really close to these guys there, and by comparison, it's about this big, and it's about this big around. You know, it's kind of, I can't ask the Marine, dude, will you, Lieutenant, will you stand here next to this thing? Can't do that, so I have to like do a pan and connect them that way, visually. It's like I'm using my, 
my camera is a finger pointing to this stuff. Yeah. All right, we'll get our machine gun up here, and then we'll just that'll be our furthest where we go, and we'll hold here. Break. Put you across. What's going on is uh, we've cleared almost half the village already. We're just getting a machine gun in this little tower up here, the the only two-story structure in Afghanistan that we can see deep. Uh, this squad is going to hold here because we got pretty clear field of fire for at least 100 meters. Captain Sean Dynan has set up a command post on the edge of the Emir Aga village and bazaar. They're going to be able to see us real good when the sun comes up. This sprawling bazaar is the prize of the operation, and the Marines move out to the village that surrounds it. Apache COC, Apache 3. Calm down. On the right, fields of wheat. On the left, fields of dried poppies. This is the yin and yang of the Afghan farmer's existence. Opium yields more profit than wheat, but it's illegal here. The Taliban has forced many farmers to cultivate opium so they can finance their insurgency. These poppies have been harvested. Farmers make slash marks on the bulbs which ooze a gooey sap. That substance is opium. Five years ago, U.S. policy was to destroy these fields. Villagers were enraged. Now the Marines leave the fields intact. They need the goodwill of the local population. Everywhere the troops go, they find evidence that the villagers left in a tremendous hurry. Like this baby's crib, still with a mattress and blanket. And this tool used to collect the opium from poppy bulbs. Bicycles, dishes and houseware, like this strainer, apparently donated by the United States. There's a break in the fighting, and the Marines fall into the routine of life in the field. It's now safe enough to send a truckload of supplies to Dynan's forward command post, including much needed water for the 200 Marines in Alpha Company. They are among the toughest of the American military. There's a mystique about the Marines, a tradition of achieving more with less and taking on the most dangerous adversaries. Know you that you're posing special trust and confidence in the fidelity and abilities of Philip M. Pepper. I do appoint this Marine Corporal of the United States Marine Corps. Today, Captain Dynan promotes one of his men in a ceremony right on the battlefield. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. No, no. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I once was lost. These men have become family, bonded by one of the most formative experiences of their young lives. In early morning light, I move out with 4th platoon to clear the bazaar. It's the last step of the military operation before they can start making peace. And it could be the most dangerous. The Taliban have controlled this bazaar for two years, and they've had plenty of time to set up defensive positions and to wire it with traps and explosives. Something really, really important happened here behind the screen, not just in front of the screen, but behind the screen. Structurally, something changed. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is it? Chad, what do you think? And this is what narration allows you to do. You mean that they're becoming a cohesive unit in a family, all that stuff? No, no not, not really. Transition to kind of a, from the end of the military operation, kind of the beginning of, uh, you know. We're almost there. To the, and, you know. the bazaar is the last, the last part of the military operation, but something else happened. Listen to this. In early morning light, I move out with 4th platoon to clear the bazaar. It's the last step of the military operation before they can start making peace. And it could be the most dangerous. The Taliban have controlled this bazaar for two years, and they've had plenty of time to set up defensive positions and to wire it with traps and explosives. Dramatic arc. They got something to overcome now, this last... Yeah. Mission. Arc yeah. within the arc, I guess. Yeah. Really. So the question is, I'm asking the audience what? Are they going to be able to clear? Are they going to make it? Is anybody, yeah. Are they having losses? Are they going to get hurt? Yeah. 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 So we have, we have a new dramatic arc, and you can't do this without narration. Right. You know? You can, in a sense, maybe just by the visuals, because it looks like it's morning, but, you know, but with the narration, it really allows you to build some tension in here, and no one's going to run to the refrigerator for a beer until they figure out if these guys are going to get But you say they got to go through this before they 
uh, get a chance to make peace. Exactly, exactly. So it's like it's, it's like a dual a dual dramatic arc here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we'll watch this thing, and probably what do you think? We're gonna end this dramatic arc quickly, or we're gonna we're gonna drag it out. Drag it out. You think? <laughs> I think drag it out because if you, people want to know. Oh no! We'll, we'll we'll show you the end of it. I would go through it. I'm gonna get go to it quickly. I'm go to it quickly. It's not a yeah. five week type yes. of uh, you know. We want to know. Go to the okay. end of the war battle right here. Okay. Let's watch and see what happens. The Marines are covered by attack helicopters. The streets are empty, and it's slow going. One Marine uses a metal detector for improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, that are so infamous and so deadly in Iraq. Now, insurgents are using them here. The Marines move door to door, blowing the locks off stalls. Captain Dynan oversees the operation. For Sean Dynan, commanding a company of Marines is a dream come true. Dynan is fourth generation military of his Irish family, which claims four Purple Hearts since World War II. He was raised just outside of Boston and graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. Dynan's been a Marine for 10 years. This is his fourth deployment, the most recent in Ramadi, Iraq, so he knows something about rough neighborhoods. Got something that could be could be nothing, but uh, don't want to take the chance. Lieutenant Jack Trepto and 4th Platoon come across a padlocked freezer. Uh, right there we have an industrial-sized refrigerator that has uh, two sets of wires running out of it. He suspects the red flag just across the street signifies a trap. Like Dynan, Trepto and many of these Marines already have served in Iraq, and they know how deadly these innocent-looking things can be. You see how I use the camera lens to point, I'm saying that red flag, and I have to say it's right across the street here, man, you know, so I, you know, I zoom out to it, I open up, we're across the street, and I go into the, to the refrigerator, to the freezer. And that's what the camera allows you to do. It's just like pointing your finger, you're connecting these things, these pieces of visual information. They use a remote-controlled robot to examine the freezer close up, and explosives to blow the lock and chain off the freezer door. This time, it's only soft drinks. Harmless. All right. Take a look. The platoon takes a smoke break, and Lieutenant Trepto brings them up to date. Yeah, I know we're not finding a lot on the way up, but believe me, this clearance is going to get a ton of out of the bazaar. And it does. Mortars already wired as roadside bombs, rocket-propelled grenades, ammunition, and weapons. The bazaar is clear. The combat part of the mission has been accomplished. But what comes next is just as tough. The Marines need to win the trust of the locals who have been living in a battle zone for years. They reach out to civilians. You see how this language works? You know, we're going to another part of the piece now. So I show these vehicles. It has nothing, I mean, really nothing to do with it, but we're seeing motion. We're seeing people move from one place to another physically, so we know we're moving from one place to the documentary as well. Yeah, to one place to another, rather. And the guy's kind of resting. You know, you had the nice portrait of the guy with the helmet. Mm-hmm. Kind mm -hmm. of looking tired. Yeah, it's, it's like there's a transition here, and I'm using the visuals to say that and complementing the visuals with, with the narration. We're taking refuge in the nearby desert. Still warriors, the Marines now are diplomats. Singe. Exiled during the fighting, the civilians are eager to return home. But not all the civilians are happy. Saeed Gould, a farmer, tells the Marines his home has been damaged by American bombs and artillery. I, I apologize for my Marines. Saeed urges the Marines to come to his home and see the damage and asks them to pay for it. Do you need anything right now that we can help you with? All of these men want something. This man says a wound on his son's chest is infected and the boy needs help. Others ask the Marines for help with irrigation. How many gallons of uh, oil we can give him? Um, tell him uh, eight. The Marines decide to hand over diesel, which fuels the water pumps.
The men said they had not used the pumps and their crops had not been watered during the past 40 days because they had evacuated the area. Saeed Ghoul is here to press his case for help. He's a respected landowner, 38 years old, married, with 12 children. He says his house is just across the canal. He cultivates wheat and poppies and has a small clothing shop in the bazaar. He offers up this bag of opium in return for help. The Marines decline his offer. All six uh, rooms, they're just, they collapsed. Saeed is not optimistic that he will get help, and his words indicate how difficult the Marines' mission will be. A civilian interpreter translates his comments. American came here telling us that they're going to help us, they're going to build things, but these are all tricks, the same tricks that Russian played. They came as a friend telling us that they're going to help us, but then they start killing us, uh, murdering people around. Uh, so ba basically we, we don't trust them anymore, the foreigners. Saeed Ghul speaks for many of the villagers caught in the middle of a war that never seems to end. We are the people in the middle and what we do is we try to just follow the religion of Islam, live our life. Alpha Company's compound is now a small fortress protected against attack. When Saeed Ghul appears, when he first confronts the Marines and says he wants money for his, for his damaged house, um, um, I, you know, I see this guy emerge and I know that this guy is what? He becomes what? Character. He becomes a character. He becomes, he becomes the embodiment. He becomes the Afghan side of the conflict. As opposed to just doing a story about the Marines, you know, we're talking about because the controlling idea is it's a military operation and we just went through that, right, with, with, the, with the bazaar. But it's also a political mission. This is the whole key to counterinsurgency, you know, the, the, the masses. So when he comes up, um, you know, this guy to me becomes, you know, the, one of the main characters in the piece who represents that that other component of this, this dual mission. Attack and suicide bombers. Hey, yeah. Sorry. So I just can't be satisfied with you know with that first conversation of him. Um, I look for this guy. Every time I see him, I shoot him, no matter where he is. Um, I, try to, I try to get other people to talk about him. Um, I'm talking to, to, you know, to, to the commanders about him because I know that I have to, I see this dramatic arc emerge and I know that I have to cultivate this dramatic arc primarily with visuals and, and also with narration to, to make this theme clear, okay? I, can't, I just can't be satisfied shooting him a little bit when I first see him and then, then letting him go. So I'm, I'm very, very actively you know, looking for this guy everywhere I go. Uh, Four days after our encounter. Sorry. How do they react to the camera? Do they, do they resent? No, this or guy do you was. Stand off and you tell a photo a lot. No, no, I'm I'm right up I'm right right with him. I, but I got I got a non on camera release from him. Oh, I told him exactly what we're doing. Yeah, through the interpreter, I said, you know, this is going to be for American okay. television. It'll be for this thing called the internet. He wow. understood that. You okay. know. Yeah. Yeah. Days after our encounter at the canal, okay. Saeed Gould um, meets at the command post yeah, with civil affairs time. officers. And, uh, he wants money for the damage to his home. Well, what does he think it would cost to rebuild that house? He said, uh, no, it's not something I just told you what it cost okay. me. Tell him, unfortunately, I don't have all the money. I don't have money with me enough to pay for this type of damage. Yeah. Saeed Ghul won't get any money today. The Marines must win the trust of the villagers, but they must also overcome their fear. These villagers lead the Marines to a dead man whose throat was slit, they said, by the Taliban. They say it's a warning not to cooperate with the Americans. They buried him where they found him. That same night, Captain Dynan coaches his Marines on how their mission has changed. In the last 24 to 48 hours, uh, our area has changed significantly. That's my, that's my wireless mic. It's gone from us taking fire on it. That's why I had clear sound of this guy giving this speech at night. Well, morning and evening basis to, uh, to zero contact and locals flooding back into the area. It's a different kind of battle now. We have locals in the area. It's going to be a little bit tougher now. All right, you treating them, treating a human being like a human being is going to make a huge difference. Uh, yeah. Dinan hosts a shura or meeting of local elders. He understands the importance of these traditional gatherings and he wants to forge ties with the locals 
as soon as possible. We throw a party. It's all out. You know, we don't go halfway. <laughs> because this area was occupied by the Taliban, this is the first shura these men have attended in three years. This is what the Marines call the center of gravity. These are the hearts and minds that must be won to defeat the Taliban. The Marines describe their strategy as clear, hold and build. But without the support of the villagers, there can be no hold and there can be no build. In attendance are the district governor and chief of police. And not surprisingly, Saeed Gul. I'm honored to be sitting amongst you right now. I know that I my, myself and my Marines are just another face after 30 years of different people coming through this area. But what I've told my Marines is that the question that they have to answer to you all is that how are we, how are we different? I know that all of you just want to live your lives and that you don't want us to interfere with what you're doing on a daily basis. And it is our intention to help and to protect you. The day after the Shura, civilians return and master their homes and their livelihoods. Shepherds return with their livestock to the canals. Shop owners return to the bazaar. And the police re-establish a presence for the first time in two years. <laughs> and you know things have changed when the kids show up. I give these little guys a look at themselves through my camera's viewing screen. It's peaceful here now, but Dinan understands that this is merely the end of the beginning. During the last days of my visit, Captain Dinan took me to Saeed Ghul's compound. That's it in the background. Wait for them to come out to us. We have to be invited in. It's surrounded by poppies and marijuana plants. Salam alaikum. Saeed apparently has been napping. Even the locals have trouble with the afternoon heat. Uh, I understand that there was some damage to your compound. Dinan gets a first hand look at damage caused to Saeed Ghul's house during the Marines' battles with the Taliban. About a month after this encounter, I got word that the Marines had paid Saeed Ghul half the money he wanted to repair his home, and the rest was on its way. These Marines may yet win over Saeed Ghul and the other locals here, but there have been setbacks in other parts of the country. Just this week, Taliban rebels nearly overran a U.S. military outpost in Kunar province, killing nine American servicemen and forcing others to retreat. The Pentagon agrees on the need for more troops here. In fact, earlier this year, the Marine Corps proposed to make Afghanistan, not Iraq, its primary mission. The Defense Department said no, and has decided that new troops can't be sent here until more are withdrawn from Iraq. The 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit has made headway in this valley. But to expand these efforts across Afghanistan, will be a major challenge for America's next president. As for these Marines, their tour of duty has just been extended until November. Bill Gentile was embedded for nearly three... A little cheesy ending there with a, with a soccer ball, don't you think? <laughs> they can't resist, you know, Hollywoodize some of this stuff, you know, what are you going to do? I liked it. Can you do this thing without narration? No. I don't, no. Think, I don't think you can. I mean, mm -hmm. you, can, you can let the stuff that, breathe. Yeah. Not that long. Well, and especially when they describe that you're embedded with them. So yeah. you, you almost are become part of the story yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. And you made yourself, you know, I showed the kids through, you know, that yeah. source of the viewfinder. I'm trying to get you guys engaged yeah. as an audience, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, don't, I think it's okay, a limited presence, you know, a vocal presence, but I don't want you to see me, you know, mm -hmm. I have no business being there, but I think uh, you know, my vocal presence makes you feel like more like you're there. Mm -hmm. But I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't develop this, this sharp dimension uh, with, with this piece without narration. I mean, you can watch the, the thing for an hour, you know, uh, but, but it's not going to, I can't build up the tension, I can't, I can't point out what's really happening without using my own words. And, and again, <clears throat> I, I, I like using my own words because I like to write. And I like this thing to have my official stamp, which is my voice on it, you know, throughout. 